<laughs> so real quick, I want to do just kind of a talking head video. There's not any slides or anything. This is just me, me kind of talking about a particular topic. That topic being basically what is a computer by today's standards or any standard by that matter. But I kind of just want to do this as kind of a breakdown for people that may not be super familiar with computers in general and just kind of give some very not super deep look into it. It's going to be deep in a few ways, but I'm not going to go into very, very specific detail on a lot of things. I just want to kind of get a all the parts of computer and then some of the differences between computers that you see today. So let's start with i guess i've got a lot of stuff on my desk so i'm gonna be moving around quite a bit showing things off so i guess we start with let's do this one first. let's just see this is what i want yeah this is the one i want okay so basically we start with the basic cpu so we have to have something to do computation so this is just a, a second gen and the Ryzen CPU. It was in my old desktop and it's been replaced since then. So it's just here, just sitting on my desk right now. I'm gonna use it again later, but regardless, that is what is known as the CPU. So it is a central processing unit and essentially its whole goal is to do all the computation and operations that our CPU needs to do. And I say CPU in that case because there's different co-processors I'll talk about in a bit, but all the main operations in our computer are handled by the CPU. And there are a few components inside of that. The most important ones would be the ALU, which is an arithmetic logic unit, which does all the logical and arithmetic based operations inside of it. And then there's also some registers that would be cache, which would be internal memory and that leads us to the next one, which would be, and you've probably heard of a lot more, would be RAM. So this is just a laptop, uh, I'll be DDR, take RAM, pretty old, but at the end of the day, RAM is random access memory, and it is used as the main memory of your system. So every time that you open up an allocation or something, any, variables or data that is generated by that program by that application is stored in RAM. It's used quite quite a lot. That's why you need a lot of it. That's when you open a web browser and you start opening up new web pages over and over new tabs. The more tabs you have, your web browser is going to eat up quite a lot of RAM because all that data has to be stored somewhere. So the computer knows what it is. You can just open up the web browser and it's like, all right, here's a web browser and just be done with it. You can do that because then it wouldn't know what to access it, wouldn't have any idea what that is. But we take the data, we store it somewhere temporary, and so this random access, it just puts it somewhere in RAM and you're good to go. It doesn't care about the actual location. There is a different type of memory, I'll touch on in just a second, but for RAM, that's just where all the data goes. That's why you need a lot of it. So if you ever have somebody say, oh, I need to speed up my computer, I just need to add more RAM to it. There's some merit to that, there's some truth there. If you have a low amount of RAM, then if you're doing some RAM heavy applications, yeah, adding more is gonna help quite a lot. But the one that most people are probably familiar with is going to be one of these guys. Or well, specifically, maybe one of these. Or more familiar for a lot of people would be one of these, which is basically just gonna be a form of storage. So a hard drive would be this. It's just a metal platter in there with a, I guess a, a head, like a needle with a magnetic tip on it that's constantly writing ones and zeros to that disc using a magnet. So it physically writes the data, which is why these hard drives are typically slower than the more now common and much more useful in my opinion, a lot better format and they've gotten a lot cheaper and better over the time but they are ssds so that'd be an m set of one this is going to be very very common m.2 i think it's an nvme one but i had to press but essentially the whole point of storage is that you need to store your data on your computer in some place that is going to permanently reside so unlike ram where it's just completely random and it goes away because it's a volatile memory it just goes away when it's done. So, okay, I don't need this anymore. 
Oof, just gone. Whether it's storage, whether it be a hard drive, or a SSD, which is a solid state drive, that resides over the course of time. And you might not see the individual parts because every single one of your phones and whatnot or your laptop, they don't have it inside of it in some form. Maybe you're more familiar with uh, it's like one of these, it's the USB. Same thing, some form of storage, splash storage that you can just write data to, take it out, plug into another one, same data is there, you're good to go. So we have some form of permanent storage. So we have the CPU at the part, which does all of our computations, all the logic that the computer needs to do. And we have RAM, which stores all the data that the CPU is processing. So essentially the CPU is working. It works in tandem with RAM. The CPU does some computation, stores its result in RAM. And then we take that, if we need it to be permanent. We store that into our actual storage. And that is the three main components of a general computer now there is one missing component and it's probably not what you've been thinking but it would be io so something like a monitor or a keyboard or something like that maybe a headphone a microphone so basically something that takes data in from the user puts it in the computer and then other devices take it from the computer and then process that for the actual user so if we take all those and combine them we get some form of a general computer now, that would be what we view it by modern standards. And we don't need all of that. Technically, if you just had something that can do some form of logical operations, whether that's just a, I don't know, something like this. It's just a little switch that just turns on and off. Technically, that's all you would need for a one bit computer. It'd be just like a light switch turning on and off. There's no logic really happening. There's a little bit of logic, but nothing really complex. So if you had two switches and they were in tandem, and maybe if you press both of them at the same time and a light turned on, like over when it turned off, there's some logic happening there. But that would be a two-bit computer with some different form of logical operation happening that changes the result of a light. Be the output. The input would be how those two switches handle. And there is no RAM or anything like that because that'd be so minimal we wouldn't need it. But I digress. Don't need a lot for a computer, we just need a few different parts. Again, CPU, there, some RAM, and then some form of storage. So, those are the three main parts, and then you'll see like maybe a keyboard, a monitor, or a desktop. But even a laptop, you have a built in keyboard, you have a built in monitor, you have all the RAM, the CPU, and everything, you're good to go, right? Mostly, now there are a few of the parts that are very, very common nowadays. One you saw earlier, USB. So a lot of compatibility there. Maybe you see something like a USB hub or something, and you can do a lot of different things with it. Now another form of expansion besides USB would be called PCIe or PCIe for more modern ones. And I know this is going to be really old, so bear with me, but we have a GPU, old ATI GPU that I have. Um, I don't have any modern ones that are spare right now, but that would be the coprocessor I was talking about earlier. So we have the central processing unit, which does all of our basic processing for the computer. And then we need something to display. So do we do it with the actual CPU? Well, sometimes, yeah. We'll touch on that in a second, but most of the time, generally no, because that's a large amount of overhead because A, when it comes to modern GPUs and stuff like that, you have to have dedicated RAM for the actual display. So there's some actual RAM on this PCB somewhere. So it has some actual memory for the display. We have an actual processor in here. It is a graphics pro graphical processing unit. So that's the GPU there. But those two work in tandem and they alleviate a lot of the workload from your CPU. However, I know that's gonna look almost identical. I just wanna make sure I grab the right one. Sometimes we have something like this. This is a Ryzen 3 2200G. That G stands for graphics, basically, but it is essentially the same thing, the first one, except for it has a onboard GPU, essentially. So it's basically two processing units of the same package. They call it APU. What, basically, it uses some system memory. So that, that RAM that you have in your laptop or your desktop or something, 
some of it is set aside and dedicated directly to the CPU to generate a display. So that's what you usually see in a laptop. But then beyond just the GPU and stuff like that, we also have different expansion stuff like this, which would be a Wi-Fi card. So when we have Wi-Fi, we have networking, we have different other things going on. So lots of different things put together. And at the end of the day, we try to make some functioning system that gives us what we know as computers today. So I have a bunch of desktops, but I'm not gonna bring them here right now because I don't have a lot of room, but I have several laptops I can show right now. But there's one desktop I'll show, but I guess I'll do just a small talking piece here. So that's all the different parts that we have. Now there's again, a lot more. You can go from like webcams and types of monitors and types of microphones, keyboards, uh, different types of CPUs, different types of memory. I've touched on most of the basic stuff right now, so I think I'm pretty good with that. But, how does it all work? Besides just sending electricities and ones and zeros in the form of binary to different components and yada yada yada. Well, that is another story for another day. I have actually a different class on that where you actually build a simulated computer from scratch. But, if you want to know about that, I'll talk about it later. But for now, look at something like this which is the old Dell Latitude laptop now. It's actually very old. You can tell by the eye on the back of it. Um, there's one USB port. It's unrecognizable. The USB 1.1. I'm pretty sure we're up to like USB 4.0 now, which are ridiculously fast, but this thing is quite ancient. Might be able to tell. But hey, there's a keyboard. There's a display. There's a mouse, like a trackpad, everything. We have a CPU inside of here. We have some RAM in here. So maybe old, but it's a fully functioning computer, right? Yeah. Now the CPU in here, which is mostly what I'm going to transition to is some of the CPU, because everything else has just kind of stayed the same for a long, long time. The only thing that's really, well, I say really the only thing. A lot of things have evolved over time, but for the purpose of what I'm going to talk about now, the rest of the video, and then for the next video after this, the CPU is going to be the main talking point, specifically the CPU architecture. So for that laptop here, this has a 32-bit Intel, I forget what type, but it's an Intel 32-bit CPU. So it's x86, that's the architecture. This is much newer, much faster, better in basically every facet possible imagine, and even the little smaller one next to it not so much better they are 64-bit amd cpus but they're still x86 because intel and amd both sub-license or co-license i guess the x86 architecture there's a whole history behind that i'm not going to touch into it right now but basically if you're using a modern system you're more than likely using an intel x86 or an amd x86 cpu more on that in a bit though Quick, I think the old Dell, actually, you know what? I think it has a sticker on it. Let me take a look at it. Yeah, it does. Oh, it's a Pentium 3. Okay, cool. You can tell, oh, right there. I'm sorry for the green screen effect. Designed from Microsoft Windows XP. So we have an old XP laptop. Why does that matter? Well, that's the operating system. A lot of people should be familiar with. Some people will be familiar with Windows. We would be familiar with, say, Mac OS and Linux and whatnot. But really, at the end of the day, the operating system on your computer really doesn't matter too much. What really matters at the end of the day is that CPU inside of it, because that's how you write software for it. The operating system at the end of the day is just software, mostly written in the program language. So just like this, which would be a much newer, but still pretty old, ThinkPad is a Chromebook. Familiar with that? It's just a regular computer, and it had Chrome OS on it, which is a variant of Linux. But at the end of the day, it still had had a 64-bit Intel CPU, and you'd write software to it just the same as you would the 32-bit, for the most part. But if we went to something a little bit more modern over here would be 
I'll start the green screen effect again. This would be a Star Lab Star Book I got for my wife. Think about these two. That old Dell, pretty sure, has 512 megabytes of RAM, like an 803 megahertz CPU. So it's it's terrible. It's ancient. It was very expensive back in the day because I think it was like an old 2000. So I forget what, very early 2000s laptop. And then we have the ThinkPad, which back in the day was like four gigs, maybe on the book, not great. This one has uh, 64 gigs in it, so it's a much faster computer, much better computer in almost every way. It has like an eight core, another one of these like Ryzen CPUs in it. And it is a 64 bit Ryzen. So if we would write some software for it, we do it the same way as the old 64-bit Intel chip. That one would be one-to-one. -one. I think for the most part, there's a few nuances there between the two different CPU architectures, but that would be different between even like a, a modern and an older Intel 64-bit. For the most part, though, there'd be almost no difference whatsoever. So, even though one is really old, one's really new, the way that we write software for it, programs for it, would be the same. And do the same thing if I pulled out. Um, not this one. <laughs> Sorry. Got the stack wrong. This uh, newer ThinkPad. So, again, 64 bit AMD processor. Right, the same way. It's a little bit older, maybe like five years old or something now. But at the end of the day, we write software the exact same way because at the end of the day, all of it is an x86 CPU. So, for these and the two chips I had here, 64 bit. 64 bit x86 architecture. So, what that means is that it assumes a specific type of assembly instruction set. And that is basically very, very low level programming, far lower than anything we're going to do in this course. What we're writing here is gonna be high level C programs. And while that works is we write a program and we run it through what is known as a compiler. It doesn't really matter what compiler, it could be GCC, it could be MSVC, all these different ones. It doesn't really matter. At the end of the day, those compilers, whether it be on a Lenovo, it be on Star Labs, a MacBook, an older MacBook specifically, it's going to compile it down to the same source code. It's mainly all the same assembly. The instructions should be identical. And then whether it be on one of these four laptops, one of these CPUs here, it's going to work just fine. Now, the one that I've shown so far that might throw a little bit off would be the 32-bit version. And that's just because if you try and write some 64-bit software for it, it's 32-bit. It, it won't work because it doesn't have that complexity. It stopped at about 32 bits, where the other ones have full complexity of 64 bits. So since it's gonna show its age, it won't work the same way. However, if our software works in 32 bit, then it should work just fine, moving up to one of the 64 bits. So it should have some backwards compatibility there. But if we're trying to take a, like, the newer 64 bit and put it back to the 32 bit, mm -mm. bad time. Might work in some cases if you, configure it properly but nine times out of ten you really don't want to do that now one thing that is consistent though is writing c and it's not just this it's any compiled language so when i pull up say this uh 64-bit thinkpad here there it is yep there it is it's gonna have the same the compiler that the Star Labs did, that the Intel ThinkPad did, that was a Chromebook at one time. They're all gonna use a 64-bit x86 based compiler. So any C program that we run against those compilers, it is going to generate the correct assembly architecture for that CPU type. And if we did it for the older Dell that was a 32-bit, it would have a different compiler, it would have a 32-bit x86 compiler, but our C code really wouldn't change too much, and that's what I mean by it's high level. So if I write it here, my program, well, I can run it on the x86 
64 bit CPU compiler basically. And it's going to assemble it all. It's like, okay, this is good. I'll deploy this to a 64 bit machine and it should work. As long as it's AC6 specifically. And again, I'm going to touch on that in a bit. But whenever I do it for the 32 bit, I need to make sure not to use that 64 bit one unless I'm running on a 64 bit system. I need to run that specifically on a 32 bit one so it works properly for that computer. So we write our C program and we just need to choose the correct compiler based on our hardware. So, where that is going to deviate from all this x86 nonsense, it's just basically the name that Intel made way back in the day when they were doing stuff. We've been using it for a very, very long time, by the way, I think it's like since the 80s or something, I don't remember the exact dates. Basically, we've been using x86 a very, very long time. However, the computers that you work with probably the most don't run on x86 they run on something called ARM. So we had something like this. This is an Android OnePlus 7 Pro. If you had an iPhone, they're running ARM CPUs. If you have a modern MacBook, an M1 or M2 processor, those are running a specific ARM variant of Apple Silicon. And if I had this laptop of mine over here that I actually picked up earlier, this is a Pinebook Pro, which has a 64-bit ARM CPU in it. And then also, one last one, I had something like this. So a few of you might recognize this as a Raspberry Pi. This is also running an ARM processor. In fact, yeah, look in here, under this little heatsink right here would be the CPU. It's tiny. But it's all running, for the most part, the same architecture. So instead of running this against a 64-bit x86 compiler, you'd run, run it against, say, a 64-bit ARM compiler. Then it would take your C code that you run against all of them and compile it all to the correct architecture. So we have a high-level language. We write our code once, and we want to just come throw it against a different compiler or the correct hardware. So. It's generally not too bad. There's a lot of moving parts again. So we moved from like the CPU, the RAM and all that, some logical operations, and then talked about different architectures and how it all comes back together to writing software for computers. So you write the code, we understand what our hardware is, get the correct compiler, and if someone's all correct to the hardware have, we're good. So when it comes to writing software, do you need it in the hardware? Not specifically too much the main part that you want to keep in an accommodation is going to be your cpu architecture because you compile it for the wrong system you're going to have a bad day and then also if you have anything that's going to be like very very large amounts of data you might want how much ram you have in your system or you're going to overload it and have also a very bad day so is that all that a basic computer is for the most part now I guess uh, I'm talking about going for 23 minutes, a little longer. So, let's go to a different type of computer. We have basic laptops, a little small desktop, I and mean, there's still an HDMI cable in here, some USB ports, etc., etc. So it's basically as much of a modern computer as a basic desktop. However, we went to something like this. This is an old Game Boy Advance SP that I have. Is your computer? Well. Take a look. We have the basic just shell in case we open it up. Well, there's a display, green screen effect. And this isn't a keyboard technically, but it would be input. We have some form of input. We have some form of output, speakers and whatnot as well. It has I.O. There is a little bit of RAM in here. I forget the exact amount. There are actually two CPUs in it. And is there storage? Uh, not necessarily storage. You don't really need to be stored. You're not really storing anything generally. For the most part. So, can we write software for it? Well, we have to be able to. Let's run something. If I turn it on, it'll work. Green screen effect. Sorry. Trying to get the right angle on it. But yeah, you see it runs Game Boy, and, and yeah turns on we have some IO there's a CPU in it there's a display out 
there's some input buttons to it, we have a fully functioning computer. Just the basic system by itself, right? Yep. But it's useless right now without some form of software, right? Well, if you've ever used one or a Nintendo Switch or any other cartridge-based uh, console, you should recognize these, the old cartridges. So these have basically all the software that you want to write for the actual systems. Put it in there, pop it open, and green screen effect. You can see it says, hello world, how are you? Can I actually get that on screen? Oh, there it is. Hello world, how are you? Right. Oh so, yeah. This would be some software I wrote for the Game Boy Advance. Well, it's actually for the Game Boy, the original one. I just, I know that if I do the original Game Boy on here, it'll green screen worse. You just can't see it at all. Let me look around real quick. Oh no, ah, here it is. Another one. So this would be one program that I wrote, compiled, and everything is right for the actual CPU architecture. Another one. If I pop it in here, eventually. Let me run it. Do this. Give me an angle. And it just says hello world. Yeah. So I have a CPU. Let's display out. I mean, as a GPU, you can just generate a display. That's a RAM. Two CPUs. One CPU is for Game Boy Advance stuff. And then the second one is like an 8 bit CPU for like backwards compatibility running your basic Game Boy games. So, yeah, full punch computer. We can write software for it. We're good to go. Not too much different than your bog standard laptop and whatnot, it's just become a lot more streamlined. Even modern consoles are far more in line with just your basic run of the mill general computer. So yeah, that's basically the ins and outs. Very, very high level view of what computers are. And it's a little bit me rambling for a lot of different topics. So at the end of the day, I hope this all made sense. I hope you did learn something. I hope it was fairly entertaining for the most part, uh, watching me try to get all these different things together struggling just a little bit but hopefully it's not been too bad anyway that's all i got i'm going to talk a bit more about actually writing software in the next video so hopefully i'll see you then see you later